Coming up on our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, we are This Week in Amateur Radio. North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1139 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The Federal Communications Commission posts email address reminders on the Universal Licensing System landing page. Tom Sly, WB8LCD, is appointed as Ohio Section Manager. The FCC Enforcement Bureau warns property owners of major financial penalties for allowing pirate broadcasting on their properties. Christmas trees in the UK are sending holiday greetings via Morse code, and they're doing it on demand. German and Iceland amateurs receive a holiday present of renewed operating band privileges. NASA scientists achieve quantum teleportation over a distance of 27 miles. Austrian amateurs gain access to new bands. The largest annual ham fest held in Texas each year is shutting down permanently. Amateurs in the Netherlands face amateur radio license rate increases. And some amateur scientists discover that the best DX comes from space. We will have all the details in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, wonders if amateur radio service will ever end. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about the apparent widespread Russian hack on the U.S. government and other businesses across the country. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill spends some time covering the history of amateur radio call signs. And... Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about how to construct antenna mounts from scrap metal you may have hanging around. All of that and a whole lot more is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. With special thanks to all of the news anchors who took time out from their busy Christmas holiday to read the news for this week's report, I'm George, W2XBS, reporting from our snowy winter wonderland headquarters here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York. And reporting from our news bureau in the broadcast capital of the world, where television and radio drived and thrived broadcasting, this is N2WWW in Schenectady, New York. And reporting from Rochester, New York, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from New York State's Catskill Mountains, where the Delaware and Susquehanna rivers are above the flood stage tonight. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Troy, New York, happy holidays. I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, hoping everyone had a wonderful Christmas and wishing all our listeners a happy new year. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story this week, reporting from Schenectady, New York, here's Pat Huba, N2WWW. Our lead story this week comes from the FCC, where amateur radio licensees and candidates will have to provide the FCC with an email address and applications, effective sometime in mid-2021. If no email address is included, the FCC may dismiss the application as defective. The FCC is fully transitioning to electronic correspondence and will no longer print or provide wireless licensees with hard copy authorizations or registrations by mail. A report and order on completing the transition to electronic filing, licenses and authorizations and correspondence in the wireless radio services in WT Docket 19-212 was adopted on September 16th. The new rules will go into effect six months after publication in the Federal Register, which hasn't happened yet, but the FCC is already strongly encouraging applicants to provide an email address. When an email address is provided, licensees will receive an official electronic copy of their licenses when the application is granted. Under Section Part 97.21 of the new rules, a person holding a valid 
Amateur station license must apply to the FCC for a modification of the license grant as necessary to show the correct mailing and email address, licensee name, club name, license trustee name, or license custodian name. For a club or military recreation station license, the application must be presented in document form to a club station call sign administrator who must submit the information to the FCC in an electronic batch file. Under new section part 97.23, each license will have to show the grantee's correct name, mailing address, and email address. The email address must be an address where the grantee can receive electronic correspondence. The amended rule will state revocation of the station license or suspension of the operator license may result when correspondence from the FCC is returned as undeliverable because the grantee failed to provide the correct email address. Applicants are strongly encouraged to provide an email address on their license applications, which will trigger the electronic issuance of an official copy of their licenses to the email provided upon application grant. Per the timing specified in rulemaking FCC 20-126, the FCC will no longer print and licensees will no longer be able to request hard copy license authorizations sent by mail. ARRL volunteer examiner coordinators have already begun including email addresses on FCC applications for as many applicants as possible. The FCC's Enforcement Bureau this week announced it has begun targeting property owners and managers that knowingly tolerate pirate broadcasting on their properties, exercising the Commission's new authority under the recently enacted Pirate Act. Parties that knowingly facilitate illegal broadcasting on their property are liable for fines of up to $2 million. Pirate radio is illegal and can interfere with not only legitimate broadcast stations' business activities, but also those stations' ability to inform the public about emergency information, said Rosemary Harold, chief of the Enforcement Bureau. It is unacceptable and plainly illegal under the new law for landlords and property managers to simply opt to ignore pirate radio operations. Once they are aware of these unauthorized broadcasts, they must take steps to stop it from continuing in their buildings or at other sites they own or control. If they do not do so, they risk receiving a heavy fine, followed by collection action in court if they do not pay it. In addition, our enforcement actions will be made public, which may create further unforeseen business risks. Under the new authority, the Enforcement Bureau will provide written notice to property owners and managers the agency has reason to believe are turning a blind eye to or even helping facilitate illegal broadcasting. These new notices of illegal pirate radio broadcasting also will afford parties a period of time to remedy the problem before any enforcement action moves forward. In the first such notices issued today to property owners regarding their buildings in New York City, the respective parties were given 10 days to respond. The Bureau will consider any response before taking further action. Commission investigations have found that landlords and property managers too often are aware of this illegal activity taking place on their premises. The Commission has previously sent warnings to landlords and even sought cooperation from national property owners' organizations in raising awareness. With pirate broadcasts persisting despite these efforts, Congress took action and empowered the Commission to penalize property owners and managers that knowingly permit pirate broadcasters to remain operating from the landlord's buildings or unbuilt areas. Landlords and property managers also may be found liable if a pirate station ceases operation for some period of time but later resumes at the same site. Separately, the Enforcement Bureau and the Office of the Managing Director also released today an order amending the Commission's rules to implement the new enforcement authority granted by Congress through Section 2 of the Pirate Act as codified in 47 U.S.C. 511. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Tom Sly, WB8LCD, 
of Kent has been appointed as the Ohio section manager, effective January 1, 2021. Sly will assume the seat that incumbent section manager Scott Yonnelly, N8SY, is vacating to become the Great Lakes Division vice director after serving as Ohio section manager since 2014. Sly was appointed by ARRL Radio Sport and Field Services Manager Bart Yonke, W9JJ, after consulting with Great Lakes Division Director Dale Williams, WA8EFK. The Section Manager appointment extends through September 30, 2022. Sly is an ARRL Life member and has served as Ohio Section Affiliated Club Coordinator since 2017. He is past president of the Portage County Amateur Radio Service and has been a radio amateur since 1968. On a 49-46 vote, the U.S. Senate on December 9th confirmed Nathan Symington to be a commissioner at the FCC. Symington previously served as a senior advisor at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Earlier, he was a legal associate at various law firms, often specializing in finance. Upon being sworn in, he will take the seat of Commissioner Michael O'Reilly, whose renomination was pulled by President Donald Trump last summer, shortly before it was to go to the Senate floor. Meanwhile, FCC Chairman Ijit Pai has announced that he intends to leave the commission on January 20, 2021, as the Biden administration comes into office. The FCC Chairman is appointed by the President. It has been the honor of a lifetime to serve at the Federal Communications Commission, including as chairman of the FCC over the past four years, Pai said. I am grateful to President Trump for giving me the opportunity to lead the agency in 2017, to President Obama for appointing me as a commissioner in 2012, and to Senate Majority Leader McConnell and the Senate for twice confirming me. To be the first Asian American to chair the FCC has been a particular privilege. As I often say, only in America. FCC Chairman Ijit Pai's departure will clear the way for President-elect Biden to either designate a new commissioner as chairman or select one of the two sitting Democrats already on the commission, Jessica Rosenworcel and Jeffrey Starks. Biden also could designate one of the two sitting Democrats as acting chairman to manage the FCC until his new pick has been confirmed by the Senate and sworn in. Until that happens, the FCC will have a two-to-two -two party split. The FCC has five members, typically three from the party in the White House. You may remember the story we carried earlier this month about London's Shard Building sending Morse code holiday messages from its uppermost lights, and that the Capitol Records Building here in the U.S. also flashes Morse code each night across Los Angeles. Well, in a similar way this Christmas, the residents of Macclesfield, a small town in the U.K., are learning what military and ham radio operators have known all along. If you want to ensure that a message gets out, send it in Morse code. That's particularly true this year with the town's Christmas tree. The tree has traditionally been decorated with paper stars bearing handwritten messages, but that was before the COVID-19 pandemic. This year, the town council had a bright idea, an idea as bright as the lights on the Macclesfield tree itself. The council commissioned a local art collective to install holiday lights that would be able to flicker messages sent in CW. People now send these messages by texting a dedicated phone number, and they are converted into flickering language of illuminated dits and da's. The installation is being called Message in Lights, and it is designed to encourage appreciation of the tree for everyone from a safe distance. Who knows? It might also encourage appreciation of Morse code, too. Hams in Texas have suffered a big loss with the announcement that Hamcom, which grew to become the state's biggest ham fest, is calling it quits. After more than four decades, it has become yet another casualty of the pandemic. The Hamcom president, Bill Nelson, AB5QZ, posted on Hamcom's Facebook page that pandemic restrictions coupled with the rising costs of producing the event made it unsustainable. He is quoted as saying that the decision was not made lightly but the safety and wellness of our volunteers, vendors, clubs, presenters, and attendees is our paramount concern. After considering several options for a 5 MHz amateur allocation, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the ACMA, 
has come down in favor of national government interests. Following a formal consultation, which would be a proceeding in FCC parlance, the ACMA has decided not to permit ham operation on the 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz band. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more on the story from League headquarters. After considering several options for a 5 MHz amateur allocation, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, ACMA, has decided not to permit ham operation on the 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz band. The 15 kHz wide band was allocated to the amateur service on a secondary basis in 2017, but ACMA says unresolved sharing issues have prevented ham radio use of the band, already occupied by more than 500 other licensed services, as well as by the Australian military. Australia's IARU member society, the Wireless Institute of Australia, argued for amateur access to 5351.5 to 5365 kHz as a compromise. The WIA pointed out that more than 80 countries have been granted access to 60 meters. Radio amateurs in New Zealand lost access to 60 meters in late October. Use of the band there by radio amateurs was provisional as part of a trial. In the U.S., ARRL proposed amateur access to a new contiguous secondary band at 5 MHz in a 2017 petition for rulemaking. The FCC has yet to act on it. Options ranged from Australia-wide access to the whole band or part of the band to a segmented or channelized amateur allocation to no amateur access. ACMA decided that national defense and security use of the allocation were of high importance in determining maximum public benefit and decided on the last option. In balancing defense's existing use of the 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz band against the impacts of introducing use by the amateur service, the ACMA has decided not to support amateur use in the band, the agency said. Public and non-public submissions from the Department of Defense showed that expanding the use of the 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz band to potentially several thousand amateur operators could impact important radio communications operations. The ACMA recognizes the high level of interest shown by the amateur community in adding this band and understands there will be disappointment. However, we are confident the decision is appropriate and consistent with the objects of the Radio Communications Act. In particular, this includes supporting defense and national interest objectives. Australia's International Amateur Radio Union member society, the Wireless Institute of Australia, argued for amateur access to 5351.5 to 5365 kHz as a compromise. A WIA survey showed most Australian radio amateurs preferred that choice. The Wireless Institute of Australia noted that because the band was agreed upon at World Radio Communication Conference 2015 on a shared secondary basis, as well as allowing low power, such as 15 watts EIRP operation, amateur radio operators in over 80 countries around the world have been granted access to the band, including many of our near-Pacific neighbors, New Zealand and Indonesia. Australian amateur operators therefore have a strong desire to be able to commence communications on this band with these countries, the WIA concluded. Two spot 5 MHz frequencies are allocated to the Wireless Institute Civil Emergency Network to provide emergency and safety communications. Radio amateurs in New Zealand lost access to 60 meters in late October. Use of this band by radio amateurs was provisional, allowing hams to use two frequencies in the band, 5353.0 kHz and 5362.0 kHz, as part of a trial. In the U.S., ARRL proposed amateur access to the band in a 2017 petition for rulemaking seeking a new contiguous secondary band at 5 MHz to the amateur radio service. 
ARRL also asked the Commission to retain shared access to four of the current five 60-meter channels. One would be within the new band, as well as the current operating rules, including the 100 watts PEP, effective radiated power limit. The federal government is the primary user of the 5 MHz spectrum. So-called interoperability frequencies in the band have been shared by amateur and federal government entities, such as Military Auxiliary Radio System, during exercises and actual emergencies. Information on U.S. amateur access to 60 meters is available on the ARRL website. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. While United States radio amateurs face the possibility of a $50 application fee, some countries have been imposing license fees for some time now. Netherlands International Amateur Radio Union Member Society, Veron, reports that the Dutch Regulator Agents Chap Telecom, or AT, is imposing higher annual amateur radio fees, including higher exam and repeater fees. The new rates go into effect 2021. Veron said radio amateurs pay the fees to support AT's activities and services, and that the fee for novice and full exams will rise from 68 euros or $80.66 in 2020 to 71 euros or $84.22 in 2021. An additional rate of 79 euros or $93.71 has been introduced for repeater stations. This became necessary to cover the cost of investigations and surveillance due to the increased illegal use of these stations, Veron said. The Government Gazette lists two rates for registration. Two tariffs apply for a use of a frequency by a repeater station or beacon per license and or planned unit, Veron said. The fee for operation is 201 euros or $238.42, up from 184 euros in 2020, while a new fee of 79 euros or $93.71 is now charged for supervision. As the Government Gazette explains, it has become apparent that relay or repeater stations have suffered a lot from illegal users in recent years. To tackle these disruptions, specific criminal investigations and supervision are necessary. In order to be able to carry this out, a supervisory rate has been applied. Other registration costs include an increase from 37 euros to 41 euros for a temporary non-resident permit and an increase from 68 euros to 74 euros for other non-exempt use of the amateur bands. The fee for a certificate to obtain a license from a foreign administration for radio equipment for conducting tests has risen from 73 euros to 76 euros. Klaus, Oscar Echo 6 Charlie Lima Delta, the HF manager of the Austrian National Amateur Radio Society, the OEVSV, tells us that Austrian amateurs have received some good news for the festive season. The Austrian regulator, BMVIT, has granted access to the 60-metre and the 630-metre bands for all CEPT Class 1 licensees. Klaus said that it took some time, three years in fact, but they've just got a nice Christmas present from the BMVIT. As proposed at the World Administrative Radio Conference 2015, better known as Walk 15, on 60 metres or 5 MHz, Austrian hams may now use the amateur secondary allocation of 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz at 15 watts EIRP. Austrian amateurs are also now permitted to operate on 630 metres. That's the medium frequency secondary allocation agreed at the previous Walk 12, a frequency range of 472 to 479 kilohertz at 1 watt EIRP. Maximum bandwidth is as per the provisions of the Austrian amateur licence. And thanks go to the 5 MHz newsletter editor, Paul G4 Mike Whiskey Oscar, for this good news. Nathaniel Frissell, W2NAF, an assistant professor of physics and electrical engineering at Scranton University, has won a highly competitive National Science Foundation career grant. The $616,054 award will fund a five-year initiative that integrates original ionospheric research into undergraduate course curricula and undergraduate and graduate research projects at the university. National Science Foundation career grants are only available to early career, tenure-track, 
faculty members and must include tightly integrated research and educational components. Frizzell told ARRL the grant will offer significant support to develop the university's newly formed ham radio club, W3USR, over the next few years. I am grateful to have this opportunity to advance the field of ionospheric physics, work with students and colleagues, and build up the amateur radio club, W3USR, at Scranton University, said Frisell, who founded HAMSI, an international citizen science space physics research collective. Frizzell's National Science Foundation career proposal builds on his previously awarded $1.3 million National Science Foundation grant to develop modular, ground-based space science observation equipment and software for collecting and analyzing data from an international network of amateur radio users, including the Ham Radio Club at Scranton. Space weather significantly impacts important modern technological systems, and the effective operation of such systems is dependent on the state of the ionosphere, Frisell explained in the introduction to his grant proposal. Understanding the connection between traveling ionospheric disturbances and atmospheric gravity wave sources in the lower atmospheric regions could improve the ability to predict the ionospheric state and thus its impact on navigation and communications systems. Through the National Science Foundation Career Grant, Frisell will apply sophisticated physics-based atmospheric and ionospheric models to extensive new data collected via the amateur radio network of personal space weather stations which he helped to develop. The new funding supports two graduate engineering research assistants at Scranton University who will conduct data analysis and run models and code implementation using a new Linux-based analysis server that the National Science Foundation proposal will also fund. In addition, Frizzell will introduce physics and engineering students to space physics research and develop the skills needed to conduct this research through an introductory physics course for first-year students and, at a more sophisticated level, through an upper-level undergraduate Introduction to Space Science and the Atmosphere course he teaches, the university explained. Frizzell earned master and doctorate degrees in electrical and computer engineering from Virginia Tech and a bachelor degree in physics and music education from Montclair State University. An interesting window now on the shadowy world of military goings-on in Russia. Well, someone has helped themselves to the very latest communications equipment from a top-secret plane. I wonder if they're busy scratching the serial numbers off. Thieves have stolen electronic equipment from a Russian military aircraft known as the Doomsday Plane for its role in the country's nuclear arsenal. Reports say that unknown thieves broke into the Ilushin IL-80 plane at an airfield in the southern region of Rostov. It's unclear where the incident took place, but 39 units of equipment and five radio boards were taken. The local government said that an investigation was underway. Military experts say that the aircraft is one of four IL-80s designed to be used as airborne command posts for Russian officials, including President Putin, in the event of a nuclear conflict. The Interfax News Agency describes them as amongst Russia's most classified aircraft. Further details have not been publicly disclosed about the equipment taken by the thieves. With pandemic restrictions precluding an in-person gathering, the 22nd Annual Ham Radio University Educational Conference will be held as a virtual event on Saturday, January 9, 2021, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or 1300 to 2100 UTC, as a GoToWebinar online video conference. Individual registration is now open for Ham Radio University's 14 informational presentations covering a broad range of amateur radio activities. Topics include amateur radio emergency communications, the basics of HF operating, communicating through amateur radio earth satellites, remote station operating over the internet, software defined radios, HF and UHF digital communications, and using Raspberry Pi computers in amateur radio. Ham Radio University 2021 will also serve as the online convention of the ARRL and New York City Long Island section. Participation in Ham Radio University 2021 will be free, 
with a suggested donation of $5. Advanced registration is required for each presentation. You're listening to America's premier amateur radio news magazine of the air. This week in amateur radio. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. So the big story uh, of the week, and probably I'm going to say it's going to end up being the big story of the year. And it's a little hard because you don't don't expect mainstream media to really cover these kinds of stories, at least not in depth. So I think uh, I shall explain it a little bit more to you, is this massive hack of the United States government. It's not the first time we've had a supply chain attack. It's the worst one yet. Uh, I'm talking about the uh, hack of the United States government, many cities, Austin, Texas, uh, many state governments as well by the Russians. This attack, they so-called solar winds attack, you might say, well, golly, uh, <laughs> you'd think the Department of Energy, which is in charge of our nuclear arsenal, You'd think uh, Department of Homeland Security, you'd think the Department of Treasury and Commerce would all have strong security. And, you know, I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. But this was a so-called supply chain hack, and it's a tough one to beat. The supply chain is is the stuff that where you get your stuff, software and hardware. And unless you make everything yourself, and there's no one who does, you've got a supply chain. We've seen uh, earlier supply chain hacks. There was, uh, you know, and this was a little controversial. Bloomberg reported that there was uh, a supply chain hack of some motherboards from China from a company called Supermicro that had spyware on them that these motherboards had infiltrated the Pentagon and elsewhere. But the Pentagon denied it. Everybody denied it. No one was able to prove it. So it all went away. Except what didn't go away is the warning that supply chain attacks are very hard to fight against. Because you get your stuff, your hardware, your software from other people. If other people's stuff gets hacked, it's hard for you not to get hacked. And that's what happened. Back in March, uh, Russian hackers, they call them Fancy Bear. It's a cuddly name for a not-so-cuddly group. It's a government group, by the way. It's run by the uh, Russian military. We're able to get into a company called SolarWinds that makes monitoring software for big enterprise systems and networks government, big enterprises, and they modified the update the uh, to their Orion software. Now, this is actually quite clever. The code is trusted, and this is the point. Supply chain stuff is generally trusted. Microsoft talked a lot about how this hack happened. It was a DLL, a dynamic link library, in the Orion platform. If you use Windows, you're familiar with DLLs. Uh, this was updated. What's interesting is that the DLL had to do what it was supposed to do what it was intended to do plus there were 4000 lines of code <coughs> added in 4000 lines of code added in that put a back door in these government security industry and enterprise computers 4000 lines of code not discovered not revealed the update was downloaded in march and the compromised file which by the way was digitally signed Again, this is this is why this is so hard to fight. From all intents and purposes, it looked good. All of the normal checks and balances were in place. It looked okay. The problem is this uh, SolarWinds Orion product is often whitelisted by security software because it is security software. And the security software says, okay, come on in. You're one of us. Except there was secret Russian payload. It was able to run privileged actions and keep a low profile and the hackers were good really good so they covered up every trace of their presence for months which meant they could wander around on these networks the doe the treasury the commerce departments department of homeland security they could wander around at will undetected and this is the problem we don't know what they did while they were there sure they probably snooped around but they might have also left behind other payloads other bad stuff And these are such large networks, it's pretty hard to... You can't do what you would do at home, what I tell you to do at home, which is, oh my goodness, you you got some malware on your system. Erase the drive, format the drive, restore your... (laughs) Restore Windows, reinstall Windows, and restore your data. Because there's no other way to get rid of it. And you know what? If you had a government 
group against, you know, going after you, a nation state hacking group like Fancy Bear going after you, even that might be, not be enough because there's places they can hide malware that you can't even erase in the, in the video card RAM, places like that, <sighs> in the firmware, <sighs> in your security software. Hmm. Microsoft called it a, a poisoned code library. Oy. It is the Orion Improvement Business Layer. It was poisoned. What's interesting is they the Orion Business Improvement Layer operated normally. And in parallel, the bad guy's code ran at the same time in the background invisibly. This is nasty. It's as bad as it gets. And uh, it's not me saying that. It's some of the top security experts in the country saying this is as bad as a hack gets. Now, there's a question. Are we doing the same thing to the Russians? Yeah, probably. If we can, as best we can. Are the Chinese doing it to the Russians? Yeah, are they doing it to us? Yeah, are we doing it to them? Yeah, everybody's doing it to everybody else. Yeah. But this is such a threat to the nation. And I'll give you a couple of scenarios. I, I don't want to scare anybody. and I'm not even going to say this is going to happen. But it's just this is the, this is the kind of threat. Uh, we don't know where this malware is or how widespread it is. And it, we may never know that, by the way. It's so deeply buried in there. It may it may just persist forever. It'll be like background noise. It'll be like cockroaches just infiltrating our systems. And here's things that if an adversary decided they really wanted to do us harm, there's some things they could do. They could, for instance, all of the financial markets these days, all of our stock markets, there's no trading floor in, in in New York City, the Dow Jones, there's no there's no magic place where you know you see it on TV. The traders are going, hey, sell, sell, buy, buy, wearing those red coats, buy, sell. That's the old days. Occasionally they'll stage, <laughs> they put a little, they put some people in there and pretend for TV. But that's it's all done on computers electronically in New Jersey. It's it's not done on that that trading floor. That's the old days. It's all done on computers. It's all done electronically. If those computers were infected, our entire financial system could be vulnerable. Our nation's power grid could be vulnerable. And oh yes, Department of Energy runs the nuclear arsenal. Now I am sure, I am sure, and I hope and I pray that uh, the people who have access to nuclear weapons have, you know, made sure that those systems are completely isolated. They're not, you know, a lot of those systems we've made fun of it are running on really old computers. Yeah. That's good. So they don't they don't use SolarWinds Orion. They're too old. They're isolated. That's good. You don't want the the launch computers to be on the same network as these hacked computers. And I'm going to trust that they're not. So I don't think and I think that that's not what the Russians are are trying to do. I'm not sure what the Russians are trying to do. I think at this point it's not a matter of technology. It's not a matter of remediation. It's not a matter of us hacking them. It's now at the political level. It's at sanctions. It's at strongly worded <laughs> phone calls. It's at that level. Because honestly, from a technical point of view, we're kind of out of luck. They're probably still in there. And even now, probably stealthily in putting uh, malware in other places and payloads in other places so that they can't be removed. And in fact, even if we do find everything and remove it, a former NSA hacker, the founder of the security firm Rendition Infosec, quoted in Wired, it's inherently so hard to address because supply chain attacks, these kinds of attacks, are ridiculously difficult to detect. It's like the attacker teleports in there out of nowhere. Oh, boy. The GAO on Tuesday uh, released a report, one it sent around in October when we first kind of heard little background noise about this stuff. Federal, this is the name of the report, federal agencies need to take urgent action to manage supply chain risks. By this time, of course, the uh, the Russian assault had been active since March, so months the Russians have been in there. The agency found that none of the 23 government agencies it looked at had implemented all seven fundamental best practices for cyber defense. In fact, a majority of agencies hadn't implemented any at all. They were wide open. It's not just the U.S. government. 18,000 customers downloaded this update. Even big security firms like FireEye. In fact, that's the first time we learned about it was when FireEye found out they were hacked. It's as bad as it gets. I don't know what the next step is. I really don't. But uh, I guess it's it, it's good to know. And, man, I hope we take some 
action about it. I don't know what it is. Wired again. The U.S. has options at its disposal, counterattacks, sanctions, or some combination of those. But the incentives for this sort of espionage, the kind the Russians just perpetrated on us, are too great. The barriers are to entry are too low. We can blow up their home networks or show them how angry we are and rattle sabers, and that's all fine, said Jason Healy, a senior research scholar at Columbia University. But it's probably not going to influence their behavior long term. We need to figure out what we can do to make the defense better than the offense. We made it too easy. But it's very hard to keep them out entirely. I don't know. This is the new world we live in. And because everything we do is online, even our banking, even our stock trades, even our power grid, and we, we are really dependent on this. And we are very vulnerable. Anyway, I'm glad you were here. And I'm here. And I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip? Into amateur radio history, I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. WN2MAM WB2MAM N2CLO KE2XB AB2CA W2XOY Okay, as you can probably guess, with all the attention on the vanity call sign system, not to mention the half dozen calls that I've held since 1969, this edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives is going to focus on call signs in amateur radio history. Prior to 1912, getting a call sign was easy. Just make one up and get on the air. Legend has it, that's how the word ham came to mean amateur radio. The letters H-A-M were allegedly the initials of the three operators of a powerful station in the early teens. With the passage of the Radio Act of 1912, the first licenses were issued. Call signs at that time for private stations, i.e. amateurs, consisted of a number followed by two or later three letters. For example, 1AW, 1TS, 8XK, etc. Other countries adopted the system. This was adequate in the early days of Spark and amateur radio, but as the shortwaves were developed and CW became universal, problems appeared. Dave Sumner, executive vice president of the ARRL and trustee of NU1AW, the station of the International Amateur Radio Union, states, When transoceanic amateur communications started becoming commonplace in 1924, a problem immediately became apparent. Call signs were all of the one numeral followed by two or three letters format, with no built-in means of determining who was where. At first, an informal system of prefixes, called intermediates at the time, was used by amateurs, where the letter A stood for Australia, B for Belgium, C for Canada, F for France, G for Great Britain, J for Japan, U for the United States, Z for New Zealand, etc. The single letter system was fine until it became apparent that amateur radio was spreading to too many countries for this system to accommodate. In the January 1927 QST, a new intermediate list was unveiled as the work of the Executive Committee of the International Amateur Radio Union. The new list took effect on February 1, 1927. It was a two-letter system with the first letter indicating the continent, E for Europe, A for Asia, N for North America, F for Africa, etc., and the second letter indicating the country mostly following the old system. Thus, stations in the 48 United States used the intermediate NU. The new system was quickly overtaken by events. The regulations adopted by the Washington International Radio Telegraph Conference later the same year included the allocation of a series of call signals such as K, N, and W for the United States and mandated that stations have a call signal from the series. The Washington regulations were to become effective on January 1, 1929, but in August 1928, 
QST noted that the Canadian amateur call signs had changed to VE in April, and in September 1928, QST announced the effective date of October 1st, 1928, in the United States for the W prefix and K outside the 48 states. Thus, amateurs sported voluntary NU prefixes for just 20 months before they became Ws. The founding president of the International Amateur Radio Union was, of course, Hiram Percy Maxim, 1AW, who remained in that office until his death in 1936. The call sign NU1AW commemorates Hiram Percy Maxim and the International Amateur Radio Union's creative, if short-lived, solution to the problem of international identification of stations. As trustee of NU1AW, Dave Sumner states that it is his intention to use the call sign as a permanent special event station operating in connection with World Telecommunication Day, significant IARU activities, the IARU HF World Championship, and other events that will call attention to the contributions of the IARU to organized amateur radio. My thanks to K1ZZ for allowing me to use the above. Thus, the call sign structure was set up for the rest of the 1920s and the 1930s. Stations in the 48 states had a 1x2 or 1x3 call sign beginning with W and containing a numeral from 1 to 9. Stations in Alaska, Hawaii, or other U.S. possessions had a K prefix. Incidentally, note that I said 1 through 9. This is because the numeral 0 was not available to amateurs at that time. As a result, the call sign districts had different boundaries than they do today. For example, the western sections of New York and Pennsylvania were in the 8th call district then, as opposed to the 2nd and 3rd today. Southern portions of New Jersey were in part of the 3rd call district, rather than the 2nd. When amateur radio resumed after World War II, the increased number of amateurs necessitated the addition of the 10th call district and the numeral 0. Except for the redrawing of the boundaries, things remained the same until 1951-1953 era. In 1951, the FCC eliminated the old Class A, Class B, and Class C licenses and replaced them with the Novice, Technician, Conditional, General, and Extra Class. What happened to the Advanced Class? The Ancient Amateur Archives will tell you in a future edition. With this change came the first distinctive call signs. Novices, who at that time could only get a one-year non-renewable license, had a special 2 by 3 call sign with the letter N following the W. For example, WN2ODC, WN6ISQ, WN2MAM, etc. When they upgraded, the N would be dropped. This system barely had a chance to settle in before the next change hit in 1953. Due to the increase in the number of amateurs, the FCC was running out of W 1x3 call signs. So 1x3K calls began to appear in the 48 states, with the U.S. possessions receiving 2x2 and 2x3K calls, such as those issued today. Novices in the 48 states continue to have the distinctive N call, such as KN4LIB, with the N disappearing upon upgrading. Barely five years later, the growth of amateur radio, particularly in the 2nd and the 6th call districts, caused another problem for the FCC. They were running out of K and W calls. So, in 1958, the FCC began issuing 2 by 3 WA calls to be followed by WB when necessary. For some reason, novices under this new system were given WV, as in Victor, instead of WN as their prefix. The V would change to an A or a B upon upgrading. After only a few years of this, the FCC decided that their original idea was better, chucked the Vs, and went back to the novice N prefix. With the uneven amateur population in the 10 call districts, it took time for the K calls to run out in the other areas. As late as 1964, you could still get a K call in the first, third, or seventh call areas, while the second and the sixth districts were well into the WBs. The 1960s had some other call sign oddities. For a period of time, you could hold both a novice and technician class license simultaneously. The FCC gave you two call signs at once, such as WA2ORS, WN2ORS. 
and you use the appropriate call based on the amateur band and your privileges on it. The FCC also allowed you to have two calls if you maintained two homes and separate call areas. For example, Senator Barry Goldwater, K7UGA, also held K3UIG, which he used when he was in Washington. In theory, under this system, an amateur could hold four call signs if he or she had a novice and technician license and two separate addresses. Except for the novice and the distinctive N, there was no way under this system to tell what class of license an amateur held. As older hams became silent keys and the number of available 1 by 2 calls slowly increased, the FCC instituted a program whereby those who held an extra class license for more than 25 years would be eligible for a 1 by 2. The length of time one needed to be an extra was gradually reduced until July 1977 when any extra class could apply for a 1 by 2. There was one block of call signs that were unavailable to any amateur regardless of license class. These were calls in which the suffix began with X, such as W1XW, W3XCV, WB6XXK, etc. The FCC reserved these calls for experimental stations. For example, W2XBS, W2XOY, W1XMN, and KE2XCC were originally call signs of early TV and FM broadcast stations. While the FCC has relaxed their position on the 1x2 and 1x3x suffix calls, the 2x3 call signs such as KA6XYZ are still reserved for experimental use. By the mid-1970s, the 2nd, 4th, 6th, and 8th call areas had run out of WBs. For a period of time, the FCC recycled older WA and WB calls that had been vacated, but when those ran out, they went to WDs. Now, WCs were reserved for and being issued to RACES and civil defense stations. Before the WD prefix could become popular, however, an incident occurred that would change the whole call sign structure. In early 1977, an FCC employee was indicted for taking bribes offered by amateurs wanting special call signs. He was convicted and sent to jail. Partially as a result of this scandal, the FCC on February 23, 1978, adopted the call sign structure we have in place today. For 18 years, from 1978 until 1996, when the vanity call system opened, it had been impossible to request a specific individual or club call. Given the passionate love affair that some of us have with our calls, the FCC has made millions. So. As you contemplate the call of your dreams, take a moment to tune in NU1AW and work a piece of history. Meanwhile, the Ancient Amateur Archives is preparing for its next journey to another moment in amateur radio history. I hope you're on board. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts. The planets Jupiter and Saturn are having their finest conjunction in hundreds of years, since the Middle Ages in fact. Conjunction is when two planets are very closely aligned in space, as viewed from the Earth. On Monday, December the 21st, the two planets lay just 0.1 degrees apart in the sky, so close that some people would perceive them as a single brilliant Christmas star. On the 22nd, they will still be very close. Astronomers have been waiting 800 years for this to happen. Apparently, the view through small telescopes or binoculars is dynamite. It's being described as a once-in-a-lifetime photographic opportunity. Just step outside at sunset and look southwest. Visit spaceweather.com for observing tips and more. As he has done each December for the past few years, Brian Justin, WA-1 ZMS of Forest, Virginia, will transmit a program on 486 kilohertz under authority of his FCC Part 5 Experimental License, WI-2 XLQ, to commemorate the accomplishments of wireless pioneer Reginald Fessenden. The Canadian-born inventor, experimenter, and entrepreneur has been credited as the inventor of radio telephony. He claimed to have made his first voice and music broadcast on Christmas Eve in 1906 from Brent Rock, Massachusetts, although his account is disputed. Fessenden's transmitter was most likely a high-speed dynamo, all alternator, a predecessor to the later Alexanderson alternator. 
He modulated the signal by placing a carbon microphone in series with the antenna feed line to create an amplitude modulated signal. Pheasanton, a few years earlier, had limited success with voice transmissions using a rotary spark gap transmitter. Pheasanton fed his signal into a substantial antenna system erected in Brent Rock for his experiments. Accounts say that, on Christmas Eve, 1906, he transmitted recordings of two pieces of music and read a verse from the Bible. Justin will transmit for at least 24 hours, starting at around 2000 UTC on December 24th, with a repeat transmission on New Year's Eve likely, keeping in step with what Pheasanton was reported to have done on both nights in 1906, Justin explained. He will use equipment of a somewhat more modern design, a homebrew master oscillator power amplifier transmitter based on a classic design from the early 1920s. It uses a UV-201 oscillator tube driving a VT-25 tube, a modern equivalent to a UV-202 to generate a few watts on 486 kilohertz. His modulator consists of another VT-25, which uses a large inductor in the RF amplifier's plate supply to serve as a Heising modulator. The audio program comes from a laptop computer. Heising modulation was used in World War I as an easy way to achieve AM and rigs such as those used in aircraft, Justin said. My particular Heising modulator can deliver only around 60% modulation, so an audio processor is used to help boost the average volume level ahead of the modulator tube. Justin uses far more modern technology to boost the few watts of modulated RF to drive a modulated Hafler 9505 solid-state 500-watt audio amplifier. The idea for the amp came from W1TAG and W1VD, he said, and information on using such an amp on the 630 and 2200 meter handbands can be found on the web. After a multipole low-pass filter, the carry output is 150 watts. Justin's antenna is a Marconi T, crafted from a 160 meter dipole some 60 feet above ground and fed with open wire line, which is shorted at the transmitter end. A homebrew variometer constructed from 14 gauge wire wound on a piece of 4 inch diameter PVC pipe is placed in series to resonate the antenna, which is fed against an extensive ground system. Most of the RF is lost due to the ohmic losses of the ground system, but at least 15 watts ERP is possible, depending on the dampness of the soil. Damp soil helps lower the ground losses, Justin said. Foundations of Amateur Radio Mark Twain is often misquoted in relation to reports about his death. Pithy as always, he said, the report of my death was an exaggeration. Similarly, the death of amateur radio has been reported on many different occasions. Letting amateurs near a Morse key, banning spark gap transmitters, introducing transistors, integrated circuits, computers, the internet, software-defined radio. The list grows as technology evolves. I can imagine our descendants decrying the death of amateur radio with the commodification of quantum computing at some point in the future of humanity. Yesterday I had an entertaining and instructional playdate with a fellow amateur. We discussed countless aspects of our hobby, things like how you'd go about direction finding if you had access to multiple radios and antennas, what characteristics that might have what you'd need in the way of mathematics, how you'd write software to solve the problem, and how you'd go about calibrating such a system. Could you use a local AM broadcast station as a calibration source, or do you need to generate a known signal? We started talking about how you'd send data across the network, so you could have a dozen devices in different locations that you could synchronize and share data. How would you control it? How would you make use of existing standards? Were there other tools like this already, and what were their limitations? Then there was the conversation about using Spectrum effectively, seeing current digital modes like FT8 and their level of effective use of a 2.5 kHz slice of Spectrum with 15 second time slots, and the theoretical bandwidth that you might achieve if you use that mode as a data transmission mode. There was the conversation around how you'd use propagation tools to determine path openings on the higher bands without needing a beacon, just a computer and a radio. Then we talked about how you'd go about making a simple whisper beacon based on a minimum component count and some readily available hardware, rather than a sophisticated transceiver like a Pluto SDR. There was a discussion around E-Class amplifiers and their characteristics and potential pitfalls. We managed to cover a fair bit of ground in a few hours, over our hot beverage of choice, a nice meal for lunch, and despite me tripping over the threshold of my front door, banging my head against the wall and rolling my ankle. The head is fine, the ankle not so much. My point is that the world of amateur radio is never done. It's never finished, there is never an end. 
There's always more to discover, more to explore, build and investigate. How on earth could you contemplate that this was a hobby that had no relevance in the world today, let alone that of tomorrow? I, for one, am very happy to call myself an amateur and looking forward to discovering what else there is to play with. Why are you an amateur and does this feel like the end or a new beginning every day? The reports of the death of amateur radio was an exaggeration. I'm on a Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima, Alpha Bravo. The Radio Society of Great Britain reports that the joint RSGB and NHS campaign called Get on the Air for Christmas was profiled in the December 2020 edition of the Emergency Services Times magazine. The Emergency Services Times is a bi-monthly magazine sent free to 6,000 buyers and specifiers of equipment and services within the UK emergency services sector. The publication is circulated in hard copy to every emergency services base in the country, as well as to 7,500 individual leaders. It's a really interesting article, and through the kind permission of the magazine, you can read or download the full item by going to the RSGB website and following the links to the Get On The Air To Care, that's G-O-T-A-2-C, online blog. With 2021 about to get underway, officials in a number of European Union nations will begin a feasibility study for a constellation of low-Earth orbit satellites, similar to the Starlink project underway by Elon Musk's SpaceX. Europe's version of the U.S. satellite constellation is envisioned as being able to give people in isolated areas access to the Internet and permit more secure communications for governments. It would reportedly cost 7.3 billion U.S. or 6 billion euros. The development could lead to a rivalry in space broadband coverage as SpaceX's own beta version is said to begin service to Europe by February or March of 2021. Starlink's goal has been to deploy as many as 42,000 satellites to bring high-speed internet to different parts of the globe. Its public beta service presently serves only the northern U.S. and southern Canada. A remarkable opening recently on the 144 megahertz band helped radio amateur transmissions in Australia span 3,200 kilometers, or not quite 2,000 miles, on the 15th of December. According to a report on the EI7GL blog, summer sporadic E season takes the credit for the big opening in which WSPR signals from John VK2IJM and David VK2DVM in Sydney were copied in Western Australia near Perth by Peter VK6KXW. One hop sporadic E is typically limited to a distance of 2,300 kilometers or 1,429 miles. The blog post goes on to say that the amateurs believe this distance was perhaps accomplished with two sporadic E hops. They noted that it is rare for this to occur at 144 megahertz and more commonly seen on the six meter band. From that same EI7GL blog, comes another bit of news about another rare occurrence, meteor scatter. During this year's Gemini meteor shower, a 144 megahertz signal from John OY9JD in Faroe Islands was heard 3,075 kilometers or 1,910 miles away in Bulgaria by Stamen LZ1KU. The posting also notes that typically Meteor scatter contacts, maximum distance is about 2,300 kilometers, similar to that of sporadic E. So the contact couldn't be attributed to one long hop scatter. According to the blog, it is now believed that John's signal may have bounced off the International Space Station as it passed over Europe. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. This is W2XBS with a propagation forecast for Friday, December 25th, 2020. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that sunspots went missing last Friday and Saturday, but large new sunspot group 2794 appeared on Sunday, December 21st, and on Wednesday, spaceweather.com reported new sunspot group 2795 emerging over our sun's southeastern limb. This disappearance depressed the average weekly sunspot number, which went from 17.4 last week to 10.3 this week, ending on Wednesday, December 23rd. Our reporting week runs from Thursday through Wednesday. In spite of lower sunspot numbers, the average daily solar flux increased slightly from 82.1 to 82.8. 
Average daily planetary A in dice increased from 4.7 to 7.3, and average daily middle latitude A in dices went from 3.3 to 6. These are still low numbers, indicating quiet geomagnetic conditions, so 160-meter propagation remains good, also aided by lower seasonal atmospheric noise as winter begins in the northern hemisphere. The predicted solar flux for the next 30 days is 88 on December 25th to the 30th, 87 on December 31st, 84 on January 1st to the 6th, 82 on January 7th to the 12th, and 84 on January 13th to the 20th. The predicted geomagnetic indicators for the same period have the planetary A and Dice at 15 and 8 on December 25 and 26th, 5 on December 27th to January 4th, 10 on January 5th and 6th, 5 on January 7th all the way to the 12th, 8 on January 13th, and 5 on January 14th to the 16th. The Shortwave Listening Post website reports that on December the 16th, the call sign Mike Zero Whiskey Oscar Foxtrot was issued to the Wooferton Transmitting Station Amateur Radio Club. Wooferton is an ex-BBC and Voice of America shortwave transmitting station located in Shropshire, England. John Norton, Golf 1 Juliet Oscar Delta, and Matt Porter, Golf 8 X-Ray Yankee Juliet, applied for M0WOF, which replaces the former callsign of G3WOF, originally granted in 1967, reactivated in 1989, but has since lapsed again. Writing in the article, Dave Porter, G4 Oscar Yankee X-Ray, said that he was pleased to report that Wooferton again had an amateur radio club callsign allocated there. The two-metre repeater, Golf Bravo 3 Victor Mike, on channel RV49, has been located at the site since 2004, but regrettably at present, coverage is severely restricted to the north by a recent on-air co-channel unit, GB3 Sierra Victor, south of Stafford. Dave said that there are plans to set up an APRS node at the site on 144.800 MHz. The transmission site is now managed by Encompass Digital Media and transmits shortwave programmes for BBC World Service, Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty and Korean Broadcasting, as well as religious broadcasters. BBC Hereford and Worcester local radio on medium wave is also transmitted from the site, as well as Sunshine Radio on 105.9 FM. Wooferton also hosts satellite downlinking and has just recently started uplinking too. You can read more at swling.com, that's Sierra Whiskey Lima India November Golf.com, and Wooferton has its own YouTube channel with loads of interesting videos. Just go to YouTube and type in Wooferton UK. Bear in mind the spelling of Wooferton. It has two O's and two F's. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. I wanted to take some time to cover some of the common topics related to installing antenna systems on towers. First, let's examine designing and installing an antenna mount for the side of a smaller tower, like the one in your yard. I have built a few homemade mounts out of scrap pieces of steel, usually built from a three-quarter inch steel pipe about three feet long and three steel bars about one to two inches across, maybe a quarter inch thick. Material like this can often be purchased off the shelf from your local hardware store or welding shop. You will need to climb the tower to measure the sizes and dimensions of the tower, legs, and diagonal members where you intend to mount the sidearm you're building. If you do not have access to a welder, have the shop weld together the mount with the ends of the straps onto the pipe, with about a, a foot between the straps, which would be centered on the three-foot pipe. This will give you about a foot above and below the straps onto which you can side mount or end mount an antenna. Pre-drill the holes for U-bolts to mount the straps onto the tower legs. Then also do the same for the U-bolts at the furthest end of the straps from the mounting tube. This mount should be set across one entire face of the tower, so it can be hinged inward during mounting or servicing. After the mount is set in place and the antenna is set on the mount, the third support strap can be clamped to the mount and tower to reduce wobble. This is not a suitable mount for a wide tower unless you intend to mount the antenna close to the tower. The most common rule for mounting distance is one half wavelength from the closest face of the tower. If done properly, 
would make the tower nearly electrically transparent to the incoming or outgoing signals. If you draw a sine wave on a piece of paper, you'll notice that the voltage at one half wavelength is zero. This is why we prefer to mount antennas at multiples of one half wavelength. At two meters, that equals one meter out, or 39 inches from the antenna to the closest face on the tower. Imagine the sidearm necessary for six meters. At 224 megahertz, it equals about 24 inches for a half wave distance. If you have done all your measurements accurately at the mounting site, you can assemble the entire structure on the ground and make sure it all fits before taking any of it into the air. Since my homemade mounts usually weigh less than 15 pounds, I usually carry them up the tower with me, set them in place, then bring up the antennas and feed lines. This plan would change depending upon the height of the tower, other antennas on the tower, or how you feel about carrying cargo up the side of the tower safely. Sometimes it's easy, other times there would be too much risk of touching other active antennas, which would make hoisting the mount and antenna by rope from the ground necessary. It is obvious here that pre-planning is essential to ensure safety and reduce the number of trips up and down the tower. While I have promoted the idea of wearing cargo up the tower, I'm the first to admit that limiting trips on the tower and hours on the tower are the real goal in any job I do. Limiting both man hours and movement will also limit the risk of death, which is cool. I've seen a few different methods of securing amateur sized coax to a tower leg. The most common I've seen is regular plastic electrical tape. The biggest problem with electrical tape is its lifespan. Mother Nature works to remove the sticky from electrical tape within the first half year. I've also seen cable ties used. As far as I know, clear or white cable ties are not made to survive sunlight, ozone, or Mother Nature's worst, which limit these to about seven months or less, especially if they are flexed regularly. I think the black cable ties are the best for outdoor mounting. Lastly, I've seen 12 gauge solid wire with insulation cut to five inch lengths and wrapped around the tower leg and coax, then twisted. I know this type of scrap material to hold coax to a tower leg for decades with no visible sign of aging. I have also seen a black cable tie over several layers of electrical tape. And coax can change size and length during the day, so always allow for these changes. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. German authorities have granted extensions to temporary operations on various bands for radio amateurs, and they did it right on deadline. Just a little more than a week before a December 31st expiration date, the German regulator B. Netza has extended the temporary use of a number of bands for amateur radio operators and increased weekend top band power levels, ensuring continued operations there through the end of 2021. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 website reports the power increase to 750 watts output for Class A and 100 watts for Class E operators on 1850 to 2000 kilohertz, which is part of the 160 meter band. The regulator is also extending temporary use for 2320 to 2450 megahertz or the 13 centimeter band, 5650 to 5850 megahertz or the 5 centimeter band, 50 to 52 megahertz on 6 meters and 7.150 to 7.200 megahertz on the 4 meter band. Meanwhile, amateurs in Iceland have also received a renewed authorization for the use of 1850 to 1900 kilohertz during international contests in the new year. The national group, the Icelandic Radio Amateurs, received the approval on December the 4th from the Post and Telecom Administration, that country's regulator. The use is subject to the same requirements as use of the frequency range 1810 to 1850 kilohertz. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts.
Scientists built a 27-mile-long prototype quantum internet in the U.S., demonstrating long-distance quantum teleportation, which is the instant transfer of units of quantum information known as qubits for the first time. The qubits were transferred faster than the speed of light over a distance of 27 miles, laying the foundation for a quantum internet service, which could one day revolutionize computing. Quantum communication systems are faster and more secure than regular networks because they use photons rather than computer code, which can be hacked. But their development relies on cutting-edge scientific theory, which transforms our understanding of how computers work. In a quantum internet, information stored in qubits, the quantum equivalent of computer bits, is shuttled or transported over long distances through entanglement. Entanglement is a phenomenon whereby two particles are linked in such a way that information shared with one is shared with the other at exactly the same time. This means that the quantum state of each particle is dependent on the state of the other. Even when they are separated by a large distance, quantum teleportation, therefore, is the transfer of quantum states from one location to the other. However, it is highly sensitive to environmental interference that can easily disrupt the quality or fidelity of transportation. So proving the theory in practice has been technologically challenging. In their latest experiment, researchers from Caltech, NASA, and the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory built a unique system between two labs separated by 27 miles. The system comprises three nodes which interact with one another to trigger a sequence of qubits which pass a signal from one place to the other instantly. The teleportation is instant, occurring faster than the speed of light, and the researchers reported a fidelity of more than 90%, according to the new study published in PRX Quantum. Fidelity is used to measure how close the resulting qubit signal is to the original message that was sent. This high fidelity is important, especially in the case of quantum networks designed to connect advanced quantum devices, including quantum sensors, explains Professor Mariah Spiropalu from Caltech. The findings of the project are crucial to hopes of a future quantum internet, as well as pushing the boundaries of what scientists know about the quantum realm. Although the technology is yet to reach the point of being rolled out beyond sophisticated tests such as this, there are already plans for how policymakers will employ the technology. For example, the U.S. Department of Energy hopes to erect a quantum network between its laboratories across the states. The power of a quantum computer running on quantum internet will likely exceed the speeds of the world's current most sophisticated supercomputers by around 100 trillion times. People on social media are asking if they should sign up for a quantum internet provider. Jokingly, of course, said Professor Spiropalu. Of course, we need a lot more research and development before the technology becomes more widespread. The Los Angeles Times has reported on the amateur radio contacts with the International Space Station. An almost all-volunteer organization called Amateur Radio on the International Space Station, or ARIS, now helps arrange contacts between students and astronauts on the space station. Students prepare to ask questions rapid-fire, one after the other, into the ham radio microphone for the brief 10-minute window before the space station flies out of range. Kenneth G. Ransom is the International Space Station Ham Project Coordinator at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. He said, we try to think of ourselves as planting seeds and hoping that we get some mighty oaks to grow. Typically, about 25 schools throughout the world are chosen each year, said Rosalie White, International Secretary and Treasurer at ARIS. Not too many people get to talk to an astronaut, she said. They get the importance of that. And, she said, the conversations are a treat for the astronauts as well. You can read the full Los Angeles Times story at www.latimes.com. Just head for the business section. And if you would like to learn more about amateur radio on the International Space Station, have a look at www.aris.org. With the Arecibo Observatory gone following its tragic collapse, China's 500-meter Aperture Spherical Telescope, or FAST, is opening its doors to the world's astronomers. FAST is the world's largest radio telescope, taking that status from Arecibo after its construction was completed in 2016. According to the French news agency AFP, China's giant telescope is taking on another role once associated with Arecibo. 
It's giving the International Community of Astronomers access to its antennas and radio receivers so they can study radio waves emitted from black holes, galaxies, and stars and even transmit and reflect signals to see what bounces back. We leave you this week with a story about DX from space. Astronomers in Australia are calling the mysterious radio signal they heard BLC-1. It's their way of describing the narrow band emission they detected in the spring of 2019 coming from the direction of Proxima Centauri, a red dwarf star closest to our sun. The unexplained signal was picked up by the Parkes Telescope in New South Wales, Australia, and later analyzed remotely at Penn State University in the United States. The findings were posted this month on the National Geographic website. Was this a type of special event station from an alien life form? Well, the listeners who received the signal are naturally hoping so, since one of the two planets orbiting Proxima Centauri appears to have a temperate climate like our Earth. The scientists who receive this signal are known as Breakthrough Listen, and their 10-year search focuses on extraterrestrials on the air. While that narrowband reception in Australia gave them some hope, at least initially, experts have advised the researchers that there is more likely a rather ordinary terrestrial explanation, since the signal is more akin to what is produced by our very earthbound Wi-Fi, GPS, and cell towers. They have also yet to receive that signal again. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater K2RHI on 146.940 MHz, serving the Tri-Cities of New York State's capital region from Mount Refinesk in Brunswick, New York. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. This Week in Amateur Radio is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Joe Ezel, KE5CLJ, saying 73 until next week.